After the end of World War II, the world was split into two, East and West. This marked the beginning of the era called the Cold War. Approaching Soviet airspace. 20 minutes to drop off. Commencing internal depressurization. Equipment check. Our main parachute. All right. You ready to go? Drop zone still showing a high pressure mass. Cab okay. Good. We've got high visibility. Cigar. Connecting oxygen hose to interior connector. Put on your mask. Does this panty waste know what he's doing? Approaching release point. Ten minutes to drop off. Hey, are you deaf? He said, put out the cigar and put on your mask. Depressurization complete. Checking oxygen supply. Six minutes to drop off, opening rear hatch. Jack, I've got some important news. The head of the CIA has finally given us the green light for the virtuous mission. Virtual mission? No, the virtuous mission. The future of our FOX unit depends on it. If it succeeds, we'll be officially organized into a unit. Virtuous mission? Sounds like some kind of initiation ritual. You know, don't get cocky. This isn't a training op. Right. So what exactly is this wonderful mission? Well... About two years ago, a certain Soviet scientist requested asylum in the West through one of our moles. His name is Nikolai Stepanovich Sokolov. He's head of the OKB-754 Design Bureau, one of the Soviet's top secret weapon research facilities, and the East's foremost expert on weapons development. Sokolov? Isn't he that famous rocket scientist? The very same. On April the 12th, 1961, the Soviets achieved the first manned spaceflight 
in history. The Earth was blue, but there was no god. Well spoken. The rocket that carried Yuri Gagarin into orbit was the A-1, known as the Vostok rocket. Sokolov is said to be the man most responsible for the multi-engine cluster used in that rocket. After Gagarin's flight, Sokolov left rocket development to become the head of the newly established Design Bureau. From a lowly technician to head of a design bureau, that's quite a success story, so why do you want to defect? It seems he'd become afraid of his own creations. Afraid? Call it a crisis of conscience. And for that, he left his country and his family behind and went over the fence? Not exactly. One of his conditions was that his family was also to be taken safely to the West. We used a mole to get the family out first and succeeded in sneaking Sokolov over the Berlin Wall shortly afterwards. I was the one who conducted the operation. The security on the eastern side was still full of holes back then. Then what? We got Sokolov over in one piece, but the whole ordeal had left him exhausted, and we checked him into a hospital in West Berlin. It took him two weeks and more than 600 miles to get from the research facility in the Soviet Union to Berlin. He was in no condition to say anything coherent. And it was only a week later that we had something much bigger on our hands. The Cuban Missile Crisis. October the 16th, 1962, President Kennedy received word that the Soviets were in the process of deploying intermediate range ballistic missiles in Cuba. The President demanded that the Soviets dismantle and remove the missiles. At the same time, he announced a naval blockade to prevent further missile shipments from reaching Cuba. But the Soviets didn't back down, instead placing their armed forces on secondary alert. Soviet transport ships carrying missiles continued on course towards Cuba. US and Soviet forces went on alert for an all-out nuclear war. Frantic negotiations were conducted through the UN's Emergency Security Council and unofficial channels to end the hair-trigger standoff. Finally, on October the 28th, the Soviet Union agreed to remove its missiles from Cuba. And so the world avoided a nuclear holocaust. But in order to get the Soviets to pull their missiles out, we had to make a deal. You mean the one where the U.S. agreed to remove its IRBMs from Turkey? No. The Jupiter IRBMs deployed in Turkey were obsolete, and we were going to get rid of them anyway. They had no strategic value whatsoever to either the U.S. or the Russians. The Turkey deal was a ruse, a cover story that was fed to the other intelligence agencies around the world. So what did the Russians really want? Sokolov. They wanted us to return Sokolov. You mean the Soviets pulled out of Cuba just to get their hands on Sokolov? That's right. What the hell was he working on? At the time, we had no idea. We were running out of time. It was either give up Sokolov or risk full-scale nuclear war. In the end, we had no choice. President Kennedy gave in to Khrushchev's demand. The next day, I got Sokolov out of the hospital handing him over to agents on the eastern side. Sokolov kept on screaming, save me, until he disappeared from my side. Then a month ago, we received some new information from one of our moles. About Sokolov? Yes. He was taken back to the research facility and forced to continue working on the weapon in question under KGB supervision. What's more, it's on the verge of completion. So what kind of weapon is it? Something to do with space rockets? No, missiles. Same technology. I guess you're right. We don't know the details, but it appears to be a new kind of nuclear device. For half a year now, the Soviets have been conducting frequent nuclear tests at Semipalatinsk. Something to do with the weapon, I assume. We're talking about a secret weapon so big that Khrushchev was ready to pull out of Cuba to get it back. Is Sokolov still in the facility? No, according to our intelligence, he's in Selino Yask, a place in the mountains about three miles to the west that's known as the Virgin Cliffs. The Virgin Cliffs? Nice name for a virtuous mission. They moved him there just recently. Why? Apparently, they're conducting a field test of the weapon, but it's our best chance to get him back. This mission would never have been possible if he was still in the research facility. This is our last chance. Sokolov must have known that, too, when he contacted us.
Jack. Your mission is to infiltrate Selino Yask in the Soviet mountains, ensure the safety of Sokolov, and bring him back to the west. If we don't get Sokolov back before that weapon is complete, we'll be facing a major crisis. The clock is ticking. <laughs> Once we've confirmed the rescue of Sokolov, stand by at the recovery point. A recovery balloon will be dropped at that point. Helium will be pumped into the balloon to inflate it. The process takes about 20 minutes. Once it's complete, the gunship's arm will latch onto the balloon and pull it up. The Fulton surface-to-air recovery system. I'm familiar with the theory. Take it easy. It's been combat proof. Do you think Sokolov is up to it? The shock will be less than during a parachute jump, and the arm can handle up to 500 pounds. So you're planning on going over the border in a single combat talent? She's equipped with two six-barrel 20mm Vulcan cannons, as well as two 40mm machine guns. It sounds like she could hold her own against a battalion of tanks. Even with the fuel in the reserve tank, we're facing a four-hour time limit. If all goes well, it shouldn't take more than a few hours. Home in time for dinner. But if anything goes wrong, you'll be eating dinner, breakfast, and all the rest of your meals in the jungle. Do you copy? You're already in enemy territory, and somebody might be listening in. From here on out, we'll be using code names to refer to each other. Your code name for this mission will be Naked Snake. I'll be referring to you as Snake from now on. You're not to mention your real name. Snake? What, you don't like snakes? What do you mean? Well, you've eaten one before, haven't you? In survival training. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. I don't know if I'd ever order one in a restaurant, but... Be careful. You might not have a choice. What about you, Major? What should I call you? Hmm, let's see. I'll be... I'll be Tom. Call me Major Tom. This will be a sneaking mission. You must not be seen by the enemy. You must leave no trace of your presence. Is that clear? This kind of infiltration is the Fox Unit's speciality. In other words, weapons and equipment to procure on site. That goes for food as well. You're completely naked, just as your name implies. Great. Now I see why you asked me if I like snakes. I suppose calling me Snake was your idea of a joke, too. No. There's a good reason for that. I'll tell you later when the time is right. Gotcha. Getting back to the subject, how exactly am I supposed to feed myself? You've been issued a knife and a tranquilizer gun. Use them to hunt for food. You'll also find some medical supplies in your backpack. Yeah, about the backpack. I lost it in a tree on the way down. I see. Well, you'd better go back and get it then. You know where it is? No problem. I can see it from here. It's stuck on a branch. To climb a tree, 
Stand in front of a tree that's covered in ivy and press the action button. I'll be monitoring your progress over the radio. We can't risk violating Soviet airspace, but I'll be in the gunship. My frequency is 140.85. I'll give you a call if I need to talk to you. If you need to talk to me, use the send function. Okay, Snake, go get your backpack. Snake, first you need to find that backpack you lost on the way down. Your backpack got caught on a tree to the north. Try heading in that direction. Snake, do you see any tufts of grass? Yeah. What kind of grass? Just ordinary grass. Nothing special. You should check it anyhow. It's pretty thick grass, about waist high. If you crawl into the grass, you can advance undercover. When you do, the camera automatically switches to intrusion view. If you want to stand up again, press and hold the crawl button once more. If you press the crawl button briefly, you'll crouch in that spot. This allows you to observe things without blowing your cover. Got it? Yeah, but... But what? Was that the only reason? What do you mean? You had me check it just so you could tell me that? That's right. <sighs> Pretty useful, huh? Right. Shall we carry on? By all means. Even when hidden in grass, if you make a noise, your enemies will locate you. When enemies are nearby, move with slight movements of the left stick. That way, you can proceed with minimal disturbance.
I see you've retrieved your backpack, Snake. To equip a weapon, it's necessary to take it out of your backpack. In the survival viewer, choose weapon from the backpack. Your available weapons will be displayed in a window in the upper left. From that list, choose the weapon you want to equip and press the enter button. For other equipped items, just do the same thing from item. Got it. Use the survival viewer backpack. Yep, that's right. Survival is fundamental to this mission. After you've been out in the field for a while, your stamina will start to drop. If your stamina gets too low, it'll affect your performance. You won't be able to shoot accurately, for example, and your wounds won't heal as smoothly. Keep an eye on your stamina so you don't run out. To recover lost stamina, you can hunt for local flora and fauna. You can use either your tranquilizer gun or your knife to hunt. My only weapon is a Mark 22 Hush Puppy tranquilizer gun? That's right. It's been fitted with its own suppressor. However, the suppressor will deteriorate every time you fire. Once its durability reaches zero, the noise suppression effect will be gone. So don't get too trigger happy with it. The suppressor's durability is shown in the icon. Any weapons and equipment beyond what you're carrying now, you'll have to find as you go. I have to find my own weapons and equipment? Whose crazy idea was this anyway? Solo covert actions are standard Fox operating procedure. You can't leave any traces of your presence. No weapons, equipment, footprints, sweat, or bodily waste. The same goes for bullets and cartridges, too. Your presence in enemy territory is already a violation of international conventions of warfare. There aren't supposed to be any American soldiers in Russia. It could spark an international incident. You can't let anyone see you. You can't let the enemy know you're there. This is a stealth mission. You're a ghost snake in every sense of the word. And there'll be no rescue if you're captured. The military and US government will deny any involvement in the affair. Then I'll just have to take care of myself, huh? I'm afraid so. You've been given a fake death pill for that purpose. SIS guidelines stipulate that soldiers on covert ops like this one be issued a potassium cyanide capsule. Tape it to your body so you can take it when you need to. How generous of you. Use it if you're taken prisoner by the enemy. It'll send you into a state of false death for a short time. Fooling them into thinking that I'm really dead. So how do I come back to life? Just take the revival pill. You mean that thing they put in my tooth before the mission? That's the one. But be careful. If you remain in a state of false death for too long, nothing will be able to bring you back. Remember that. I'll keep it in mind. You said this was a solo mission, right? Right. I guess that means I can't count on any reinforcements. Correct. The mission rests entirely in your hands. A real one-man army. Relax. There's a support team ready to back you up over the radio. Who? I'll introduce them to you. This time, survival is of utmost importance. The first member of the support team will be in charge of monitoring your physical condition, acting as a medic, so to speak, as well as recording your mission data. She's a member of Fox as well, and she's here on the gunship with me. She? Hello, Snake. I'm Paramedic. Nice to meet you. Paramedic? As in a medic who comes in by parachute. Aren't you going to tell me your real name? Are you going to tell me yours, Mr. Snake? My name, huh? It's John Doe. And they call you Jack for short. You're a regular Captain Nemo. A name means nothing on the battlefield. After a week, no one has a name. What's your name? Jane Doe. Very funny. I wasn't joking, but I'll tell you my name only if you manage to make it back alive. My frequency is 145.73. She's also in charge of recording your mission data. Whenever you want to save, send a message over the reserved save frequency, 140.96. So saving lets me record my mission data. That's right. It also records the state of your health. Good to know. There's one more person I want to introduce you to, Snake. Huh? Speaking of snakes, you remember the boss, don't you? A legendary soldier and your mentor. Actually, it was the boss that got the DCI's authorization in the first place. She's going to be serving as Fox's mission advisor. The boss is? She also helped me plan this mission. She and I were at SAS together. Jack, is that you? How many years has it been? Boss? That's right. It's me. Oh. Talk to me. 
Let me hear your voice. It's been five years, 72 days, and 18 hours. You've lost weight. You can tell just by the sound of my voice. Of course I can. I know all about you. Really? Well, I don't know anything about you. What's that supposed to mean? Why'd you disappear on me all of a sudden? I was on a top secret mission. Hmm. You didn't need me anymore. But there were still so many things I wanted you to teach me. No, I taught you everything you needed to know about fighting techniques. I taught you all I could. The rest you needed to learn on your own. Techniques, sure. But what about how to think like a soldier? How to think like a soldier? I can't teach you that. A soldier needs to be strong in spirit, body, and technique. And the only thing you can learn from someone else is technique. In fact, technique doesn't even matter. What's most important is spirit. Spirit and body are like two sides of a single coin. They're the same thing. I can't teach you how to think. You'll just have to figure it out for yourself. Listen to me, Jack. Just because soldiers are on the same side right now doesn't mean they always will be. Having personal feelings about your comrades is one of the worst sins you can commit. Politics determine who you face on the battlefield. And politics are a living thing. They change along with the times. Yesterday's good might be tomorrow's evil. Is that why you abandoned me? No, it had nothing to do with you. I already told you, Jack, I was on a top secret mission. A soldier has to follow whatever orders he's given. It's not his place to question why. But you're looking for a reason to fight. You're a natural-born fighter, but you're not quite a soldier. A soldier is a political tool, nothing more. That's doubly true if he's a career soldier. Right and wrong have no place in his mission. He has no enemies and no friends. Only the mission. You follow the orders you're given. That's what being a soldier is. I do whatever I have to to get the job done. I don't think about politics. That's not the same thing. Sooner or later, your conscience is going to bother you. In the end, you have to choose whether you're going to live as a soldier or just another man with a gun. There's a saying in the Orient, loyalty to the end. Do you know what it means? Being patriotic. It means devoting yourself to your country. I follow the president and the top brass. I'm ready to die for them if necessary. The president and the top brass won't be there forever. Once their terms are up, others will take their place. I follow the will of the leader, no matter who's in charge. People aren't the ones who dictate the missions. Then who does? The times. People's values change over time, and so do the leaders of a country. So there's no such thing as an enemy in absolute terms. The enemies we fight are only enemies in relative terms, constantly changing with the times. As long as we have loyalty to the end, there's no point in believing in anything, even in those we love. And that's the way a soldier's supposed to think. The only thing we can believe in with absolute certainty is the mission, Jack. All right, but do me a favor. What is it? Call me Snake. Snake? Oh, right. Your code name is Snake. It suits you well. That's right. The legendary unit that the boss put together during World War II was a snake. The Cobra unit. A group of heroes that brought the war to an end and saved the world. As long as you've got a legendary hero backing you up, you'll be fine. Isn't that right, Snake? Yeah. I can't think of anyone else I'd rather have with me. Oh, and one more thing, boss. Yes? It's good to hear your voice again. Same here. After all, who knows if either of us will make it out alive. Snake, you are always best at urban warfare and infiltrating buildings. But this is the jungle. Survival is going to be key. Those CQC techniques I taught you are sure to come in handy. CQC? Close quarters combat, huh? I've been in the Green Berets for the past few years. I'm probably pretty rusty. Not to worry. I'll be here to help you remember. After all, this is your first actual survival mission. I'll be supporting you over the radio. Where are you, boss? Next to the Major? The boss is communicating with us by radio from aboard a permit-class submarine in the Arctic Ocean. My frequency is 141.80. Call me if you need my advice on battle techniques. 
Gotcha. Your mission is to retrieve Dr. Sokolov. Dr. Sokolov is being held in an abandoned factory located to the north of your current position. Avoid heavy combat and don't let anyone see you. Don't forget that this is a stealth mission. Snake, try to remember some of the basics of CQC. Commencing virtuous mission now. That area is home to the reticulated python. The reticulated python is said to be the longest snake in the world. The biggest ones can grow up to 10 meters in length. Although they're not poisonous, they're still very dangerous, so be careful around them. They have a highly ferocious temperament, and they can swallow whole, even large animals like deer and pigs. Their most distinguishing feature is the mesh pattern of their scales. This pattern acts as a highly effective natural camouflage. If you think there might be a reticulated python about, pay close attention to your surroundings. Otherwise, you could get bitten before you even know it's there. It's a huge snake, but you should be able to capture it alive by using the tranquilizer gun. I'll bet if you capture one and throw it at an enemy, it'll give him a good scare. Right. But how do they taste? Huh? Do they taste good? You're actually going to eat one. Why else would I be asking? Cannibal. What was that? Nothing. Let's see what the guide says. Ah, you're in luck. It says they taste pretty good. Good. I can hardly wait. Ugh.
Snake, be careful of that swamp. What's dangerous about it? It's a bottomless swamp. A bottomless swamp? Yes. The mud in that swamp is highly viscous. It will stick to your body like tar. It will be impossible for you to swim. If you get swallowed by the bottomless swamp, you won't be able to escape on your own. Once you sink down to about head level, you'll be trapped for good. Make sure you get out before that happens. So, I have to make sure I don't sink too far. Got it. Snake, wait. There's more? Yes. What? Crocodiles. Crocodiles? Yes. Crocodiles, like the reptile. That's correct. More accurately, they're Indian gavials. What are crocs doing deep in this forest? You'll have to ask Paramedic about that one. Paramedic? Yes. The Indian gavial is a crocodile that originally lived in freshwater regions in India and Nepal. Why are Indian crocodiles way out here? They're captive crocodiles that were brought here for research purposes but escaped and became wild again. Indian gavials are large creatures. Adult males grow to over six meters in length. You'll never catch one alive, even if you use the tranquilizer gun. Got it. So, how do they... Taste? Yes, I did look into that. You know what they always say. Tastes like chicken. Sounds delicious. But be careful when capturing an Indian gavial. Normally they're cowardly creatures, but the ones in the forest there are belligerent. Apparently they attack humans. What do you mean? They weren't the direct subject of any serious research, but some think they may have become violent as a side effect of the atomic research that was conducted nearby.